So, so this is lecture 12 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, we're going to actually take a small detour from, uh, from what we looked at before with respect to filtering and frequency responses and such, because I, wanna, I, want, I really want to sort of focus on why, why this course is so important. Okay? So I think I mentioned it in the first lecture. I think it doesn't hurt to explain it in this lecture as well. Um, but, but sort of reiterate why DSP is so critical, why we have people in this class from places like mechanical engineering, civil engineering, robotics engineering, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, computer engineering. It really comes down to the fact that um, when, it come, when you look at a system, whenever you collect information, it might be analog information that you're collecting. Temperature, which of course in this time of the year is, is always below freezing. Um, it might be electrical signals in the nervous system or in the heart. Could be wireless signals. Could be visual information. Could be sound information, speech information. Um, but all that information, if we want to do anything fancier than just read off of a thermometer, right, or some sort of analog gauge, we might want to do some more processing on it. And whenever we do that processing, it's almost always going to be digital, and it means that we're going to have to digitize this thing, right? So in order to digitize correctly, what we need to do is we need to sample, right? More importantly, suppose we want to sample, and then we want to put that signal back out, and we want to make it a continuous time signal again. What we need to do is we need to know how to properly reconstruct the continuous time signal from the digitized signal. So th this, this little diagram here, it's kind of cute, and this is maybe how it was in the old days. Uh, you had an analog input, you had an analog circuit that did some analog processing in order to get an analog output, right? Like, um, uh, you know, a bunch of resistors, capacitors, inductors, and who knows what. Nowadays, and, and you know, I have a bunch of student projects that focus around this, they have all these sort of analog inputs. They then have an analog to digital converter. They may not know that there's an analog digital converter, but there's an analog digital converter in there. So what happens is they have the analog signal. They put it into some sort of input to their Raspberry Pi or some sort of bus. And then the Raspberry Pi magically does its thing. And then supposedly maybe it spits out a signal back into wherever and looks analog to me. But there's probably an A to D or D to A in that Raspberry Pi, right? And that, that's one type of platform that might have it. There are tons of these interfaces between the digital and the analog domain, and the reason for that is analog is, you know, like I remember when I was an undergraduate student, everybody wanted to be the analog designer because they made the six-figure salaries, which in Canada, I have to tell you, is almost impossible since <clears throat> everybody's uniformly poor to, no. No, not uniformly pour together. But, you know, there's that allure. Oh, the analog circuit designer. <sighs> you know, like they, 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 they drive their BMWs or whatever. But what happens is you don't see many of those nowadays except in very specialized applications. For the most part, digital is king, right? Like even, it's kind of interesting. I know folks in analog devices and... Uh, you know, some people do do the analog design, but a lot of people do digital. You'd be surprised. A lot of projects, student projects I had done at analog devices were digital projects, and they need digital people to do these things. Sure, they, they're in the business of making A to D, D to A converters, but there's a lot of digital involved there, too. And the reason for that is cheap, it's easy, it's flexible. All you need is a wicked fast analog digital digital analog converter. So, um, the questions are, and we didn't quite answer this too much in the previous lectures, but I'm going to ask them now. The first one is, is there a way that we can sample a continuous time signal and process it in the discrete time domain without any loss of information? That is to say that I sample at a sufficiently high enough rate. I don't want to sample it too slow because maybe I'm missing information. I think I mentioned that in the last lecture. I talked about when you have a frequency response, you have magnitude and you have phase. Otherwise, you're throwing away 50% of the information when you display it. This is, in some ways, the same thing. I want as much information 
that's needed in order to accurately represent that continuous time waveform in my discrete time world, so I can process it. The second question is actually much more important if you want to spit out an analog or continuous time waveform from a digital world, and that is, what do I need, what, how can I reconstruct a continuous time signal from that discrete time signal? And so that's where the D to A and the A to D, the, the analog digital, digital analog converters come in. So, <laughs> sorry. I, I, you know, like inside every analog devices or every computer board or any time you have like a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal, you expect to find one of these. And it's a little blob that has a little arm thing that goes boop, 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 boop. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but, but this is kind of like a symbolic representation. What this tells me is that when I have a continuous time signal comes in, Sample, 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 sample. And everything in between I just throw away, right? And it's interesting. Like, what we have to be mindful of is how fast we're sampling. So whenever you hear about, um, you know, an analog digital uh, converter, right, and you hear about things like resolution, we'll talk about some of the key parameters or key characteristics of your analog digital and digital analog converters, one of which is this thing called resolution. And what resolution is, is essentially, um, uh, like, you know, uh, like how fine, like, you know, are, can you represent um, a continuous time waveform? And uh, you'll see, like, you know, there's other things as well, like in the sampling rate, um, the resolution, and a few others, which we'll discuss later. But uh, this, the rate at which I sample, I want to sample a sufficient number of samples, or I, I want to take a sufficient number of samples from a continuous time waveform, because if I sample too slowly, I begin losing sort of key characteristics of that time domain waveform. What I want to do is I want to sample fast, and that's where you get this cost-benefit analysis, because you can have a really fast analog to digital converter, fastest ADC in the shed, right? But the problem is, oh my god, that price tag is just so big. And suppose you're trying to build cell phones for next to nothing, right? You don't want super duper fast. You don't want something that needs to be liquid cooled because it's so hot, because it's sampling so fast. What you want, though, is something that is also not molasses slow, such that this signal looks exactly like that signal, which looks exactly like that signal. But that's my mom's speech, that's my speech, and that's my dad's speech. That's also not a winning combination. So you need something with sufficient sampling rate that you can characterize that signal, okay, uh, and have a sufficient amount of information in it. So the question now becomes, um, so we looked at, so far, we looked at uh, continuous time Fourier transforms and we looked at discrete time Fourier transforms. And I think the first step to understanding all of this, because the first step we need to understand is, what do we know about continuous time Fourier transforms? What's their spectral characteristic? They're aperiodic, right? They only have this frequency contribution for all minus infinity to infinity, right? What about discrete time Fourier transforms? They're periodic, right? Boop, periodic replica, boop, periodic replica, boop, and happens every two pi, two pi, two pi, two pi, two pi. Now, what's kind of interesting is this is going to help us dictate how fast we're going to sample, right? Because we want to avoid aliasing. I did mention this before several times. This is sort of the, the thing I absolutely want to avoid, right? Because when we have aliasing, that's th that issue I was telling you about, where if we don't sample fast enough, and we have a signal with a specific bandwidth, what we find is there's a specific mathematical relationship that if we do not satisfy, I will not be able to recover that signal. Everything looks like gobbledygook. You're going to have all those periodic replicas overlap with each other, and all hell will break loose. So what we first need to do is understand. So I did a really poor job. OK, I admit it. I did a really poor job of explaining why we get periodic replicas in the discrete time Fourier transform domain, when in the continuous time Fourier transform domain, I only have the one, right? So this mathematical derivation that I have here for next page, next slide and a half, sort of now puts into context, this is proof positive why we have periodic replicas, right? 
So what I did is, side by side, I have the continuous time Fourier transform representations, both uh, getting the frequency response and getting back the time domain response, right? So here's xA of f, big F. So big F signifies that we're in the continuous time frequency domain. A represents that's an analog waveform. And T here represents a continuous time, right, time index. And we have the representation. And then here, what we've got is the discrete time Fourier transform. So instead of an integral, we have a sum, um, at least when we go from the time domain to the frequency domain. And we have the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. And here we do have an integral. But instead of from minus infinity to infinity, we have from minus pi to pi, depending if it's omega. And if it's f, from minus a half to a half. So there are some similarities and some very significant differences. The limits of integration for the inverse transform, big difference. The summation versus the integral, big difference. What I'm going to show you is that when we sample, what ends up happening is we get the discrete time waveform from a continuous time waveform, and the spectra now becomes periodic. All right? So how do we do that? First things first, I'm going to make this little equivalent. So what I'm going to say is x of n, this is my discrete time signal, is equal to the continuous time signal sampled every t seconds. Boop, 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 boop. I know, sound effects are included. And what is t equal to? 1 over fs, fs being the sampling frequency. right? So I can either do nt, so every t seconds I sample, which is equal to every 1 over fs seconds. Now, that in turn, this guy here, this is the expression for the, continuous, uh, the inverse continuous time for a transform, right? In infinite, minus infinity to infinity, that's the limits of integration. We have this x of a of f, that's still the same. And then that exponent thing, df. Notice that I've replaced, that I replaced t, little t, which is in here, with n over fs, right? So if we go to the original definition, Notice that I have a little t here. I replace little t with nt, which is equal to n over fs. So I get this guy. And so now, this almost looks like, you know, it's the ICT, um, ICTFT, so the inverse uh, continuous time Fourier transform. And I just replaced T, little t with n over fs. So far, I've done nothing wrong. What I've done, essentially, is I've taken the analog waveform, and I've sampled it by n over fs seconds, every n over fs seconds. Now, I do a comparison. I take this guy, and I say, how is he similar to the discrete time, or sorry, the inverse discrete time Fourier transform, this guy over here? And the difference lies with respect to mi minus one half to one half limits of integration in that guy. So what we want to do is essentially be able to equate the two together. So this is when I do a few little tricks. Okay. So first of all, um, I have this big F over big FS. I let it equal to little FS. That's actually legit. What happens is, when we have the discrete time Fourier transform, that little f is actually big F normalized by the sampling frequency, right? And then we do the 2 pi business in order to get the radians. We get the omega. Now, if we have this, and we actually can manipulate it around, so we can actually get big F is equal to little f time fs, what we can do is something called change of variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this guy the same. And instead, I'm going to look at this side here, the right-hand side. 
and I'm going to change the variables now. So I'm going to let big F now be equal to little f fs and replace that throughout the entire expression. This expression, little f here, I'm going to replace it with f over fs and, and throughout this entire place I'm going to eliminate little f to only give me the big F and the big FS. Yes? Ah, okay. So that's an excellent question. So what happens is, and this is actually related to the DF. So what happens is, so we, ha we know that F is equal to uh, big F over big FS, right? And so DF is going to be equal to D, D big F over FS, right? And so that's one place. We also know that the limits of integration is going to be equal to little f is equal to a minus a half, and little f is equal to plus a half. So what ends up happening is we now replace little f by big F over FS equals minus a half, and big F Actually, maybe I should work that out. And, of course, I'm going to get so lost. But I'll give it a try, okay, folks? Okay, so what we've got is the following. Okay, so far so good. Uh, just want to make sure I don't mess up. XF. Okay. E to the J. Oh, come on. Uh, 2 pi FN DF. Okay. 2 pi FN DF. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to do change. Uh, variables. So I know that this is true. Okay. I also know that df is going to be equal to df1 over fs as well, right? So this is going to be changed out. This guy is going to be changed out. That guy is going to be changed out. All of these. So what ends up getting what we end up getting is this. So we now have f over fs is equal to minus a half. I have f over fs equals plus a half. I have f, uh, xf over fs e to the j 2 pi f over fs n. So I'll put n over there. d, f, and then 1 over fs. So what I can do is I can move this guy to the numerator there, this guy to the numerator there, um, and this guy can move him to the front there. So that's, that's why at the end of the day, what I get is I get f is equal to minus fs over 2, f is equal to fs over 2. I can get x f over fs e to the j 2 pi n f over fs, oh, sorry, 1 over fs, df. Okay? So that's, that's how we get this expression. But, but wait, there's more, right? So, so what happens is I want to set the stage because ultimately what I'm going to show is that the left-hand side can be made to be equal to the right-hand side. Right? That's a great question. And I think what ends up happening is I do this trick. Yeah, I think I forgot to put the fs in that. So that, that's a boo-boo. So this guy here, where my, my hand is, that, that should be 1 over fs. So I think I probably left that out somewhere. So, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, so that, that should actually be there should be a, like a scaling factor with that frequency term. But going, going through this, um, what we want to do now is we kind of leave that alone, that side of the, of the expression. Because what we want to do 
The reason why I set this up is I want things in terms of F. Why? Because I want to now, what I want to do is I want to show what is the relationship between X of A and X. That's really my goal. So I'm, I, I, I goofed in the derivation. I forgot the uh, over FS term inside X of F. That's fine. Like, you know, that, that's just a scalar constant to, to that guy. So um, we'll, we'll figure that out later. But now what I want to do is I want to take, like, I want to figure out what is the relationship of that guy with this guy. So remember, big F has a significance. It means that this is continuous time frequency representation, right? I want to figure out how the analog, the continuous time waveform, relates to the discrete time waveform, which is X. In order to do that, what I want to do is now I take the left-hand side, this guy, and I, and I do a little trick. I do a little trick. And what that trick is, is I can integrate from minus infinity to infinity, x, a, f, e, j, 2 pi, n, f, or f, s, d, f. Oh, that looks really familiar, right? That looks like almost a thing that I had, with the exception of the limits of integration. Um, there was that term that's inside uh, x of f, right? But otherwise, everything looks, and then there was that constant in the front, but otherwise, everything looks the same. Here's the trick. I can either integrate everything from minus infinity to infinity, or I can integrate every FS segment from minus infinity to infinity. What I can do is I can say, I'll integrate this thing across FS, and then the next interval I can integrate across FS, and then the next interval integrate across FS, and do that from minus infinity to infinity. OK, so you might say, w w w what? OK. <laughs> Wah, wah, wah. Okay, so here's wah, wah, wah. Okay. Do, 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 do. Ah, no. Okay. Let me try again. Yay. So this is what I mean. So there, this is a little trick that you can pull. You can either integrate from minus infinity to infinity something, right? And you can integrate this guy. Or... You can do what I do, which is, let's say I'm going to integrate this guy across fs in frequency band, then this guy fs in frequency, this guy fs in frequency, this guy fs in frequency, and so on. And then I sum up the individual terms. So what I can do is I can take this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and then sum them all together, and it will be equivalent to integrating across all infinity. And so I do this by design, because what I'm going to do is, if I do it that way, now I get something that looks awfully similar to what I derived before with respect to the right-hand side. So if I do that, <coughs> what ends up happening is, if I do that manipulation, now I have the summation of these individual terms. I'm going to pull another trick here. Instead of changing limits of integration and saying, OK, here's x a of f. Here's a new integral. Here's a new integral. Here's a new integral, and so on and so forth. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the limits of integration the same, and I'm going to shift the function across the stationary limits of integration. So I can do this one way or another, right? So it's almost like the joke about, like, you know, how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb, right? So either, um, you know, I, I forgot how, so you can either do one of two things, um, or several things. Um, so you have one person holding a light bulb, and you have nine other people holding the stepladder, rotating the stepladder. Or if, let's say, you don't have a floor for that house, you can have, let's say, one person holding a light bulb on the stepladder and a few hundred people rotating the house or something like this. This is almost the same thing. You either can shift the limits of integration every fs frequency, right? Or what you can do is shift by every fs, slide your function from left to right, and integrate across the same limits of integration. Your choice. I would much prefer having a constant limit of integration because that's what I have right now with my right-hand side. And then that shifting function, that's going to be really powerful stuff.
Because now with that shifting function, what I'm going to do is I have this guy, and I'm going to pull another trick. Oh, I'm just full of tricks today. So what I'm going to do is now that I have this guy, I'm going to switch integration and summation because they're linear operators. I can totally do that as long as they don't depend on each other, right? And so if I do that, I get this. I get the summation of all these analog shifted by multiples of fs, right? Analog uh, frequency responses. And you know what this kind of looks like? This looks like 1 over fs x of f. And I forgot, of course, to divide by fs inside. But this guy, what this guy says, like, you know, this tells me that essentially, like, I take this analog waveform, and it's some, like, you know, all these shifted versions from minus infinity to infinity is equal to my discrete version. So what does this mean? It means that there are, these are replicas, right? What this tells me is that x of f is equal to f of s times the sum of all these guys. So shift, 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 shift. All of these guys sum together. And what this, and as a result, if you have this guy, it's kind of interesting. What, what ends up happening is, suppose that your, the bandwidth the bandwidth of your, um, you know, that x a of f is half of f of s. What do you have? What this tells me is that x of f is equal to the periodic replicas of x a of f. So let's go back to this guy. So let's go here. So what this tells me is the following. So suppose that x a of f looks like this, okay? And let's say it is right over f. Now what I've got is this guy and I have x a of f, f minus k f s, right? Right? And this guy is equal to 1 over f s, x f over f s. So this term here. I might have made a typo, but. So what ends up happening is this is our, that's our digital discrete time, right? our discrete time frequency response. This is our continuous time one, right? And what this tells me is if we look at x of f, right, which is, in fact, this guy, what we end up getting is every fs, we get an fa. So this is fa of f. This is f minus fs, right? That's centered fs. This is now 2fs. This is minus fs, minus 2fs. So what this tells me is that my sampled, my sampled analog waveform will give me periodic replicas of the frequency response of the continuous time frequency response, all right? So that's where this all comes from. So th all this math that I've been talking about for the last 15 minutes really comes down to sort of highlighting this fact, all right? So whenever anybody says, oh, what would be the impact? Like, let's say someone asks you a question. What would be the impact of sampling this continuous time waveform? Well, the, the sampled version, the frequency response of these um, discrete time wave, uh, waveform uh, frequency response is going to be a sampled, ver it's going to be a periodic replicas of the continuous version, continuous time version. Which, you know, that's why we have, when we look at the spectra, we look at the frequency response, the frequency domain of a disc discrete time Fourier transform, we always have replica every 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi, when we have omega.
right? Okay. Now. Okay. So enough of math for now. So this is where Nyquist actually comes in because what happens is we don't choose FS right. So this, this is where if we don't sample sufficiently fast, we start getting aliasing. So I was telling you guys about like, you know, suppose we have the bandwidth of the signal. So we need to make sure that the sampling rate is at least twice the, the, twice the bandwidth of the signal because if we don't, what we end up getting is those replicas that constantly, um, you know, when we sample, when we, we the sampled um, periodic replicas of that continuous time spectra, they begin to overlap. And when they overlap, then it's all gobbledygook. It becomes very difficult to separate out the signals or do any fancy signal processing with those signals. And so this is what I mean. If we choose correctly, the periodic replicas have enough of a space in between each other such that if we ever want to extract out a replica and recreate the continuous time signal, we can easily do that. We just cut out a replica. We filter out a replica. Ta-da! We get our continuous time waveform. On the other hand, if we sample too slowly, the periodic replicas overlap with each other in the frequency domain, and bad news, we can't do much with that, right? So as a result, if we try and filter out one replica, what we get is something that may not look anything or looks kind of messed up relative to what we initially had at the input the continuous time input. All right. So there's one other mathematical expression. And so it, it goes into some detail. But um, if I wanted to recreate, let's say if I wanted to recreate a signal, ideally, how would I do it? So let's say I have, let's say, my discrete time signal. Um, I did not alias. OK. Make sure we didn't alias. Um, how would I reconstruct a discrete time signal back into the continuous time domain? And the answer is so, sing, square, waves. square waves, exactly. Which, um, well, square waves, well, square waves in the frequency domain, right? So you would filter out a replica. That would be the ideal. So we talked about the ideal. What's the problem with the ideal? Sync functions in the time domain. And so that's what we see here is these guys over here. So this actually requires a little bit of drawing in itself. So let's, let's look at that. OK. So what ends up happening is we know that if, let's say, here's my discrete time Fourier transform. Periodic replica, periodic replica, periodic replica, periodic replica. Right? And let's say that's 0, and uh, that's 2 pi, and 4 pi. So this is omega, of course, right? Minus 2 pi, minus 4 pi, minus 6 pi. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. So what happens is we know that each one of these replicas, we call them a replica. Each one of these replicas. Um, you know, have the characteristics of the original continuous time frequency response. This is desirable because if I ever want to create, if I ever want to do D back to A, what I would need to do is filter out one of the replicas and throw away the rest and use that instead. And so in order to do that, um, in order to do that, what I would need is a low-pass filter if I'm going to do the replica at DC, at zero uh, frequency. Now, the problem is this guy, this filter, this ideal filter, the problem is if, suppose, like, you know, so this is in frequency domain, so it would be product, right? So let's say this signal here, all these periodic replicas are x of omega, and we have h of omega, and that would give us the output um, xa hat of omega. And you might say, OK, what's hat? And I mentioned this in my uh, other class, my uh, 4305 class, 
um, what the hat is in French. It's si complex. Okay, so a little bit of culture there. So what happens is hat or si complex uh, represents estimate, reconstruction. We usually want this to be exactly like the original, right? The original x of a of omega. Now the problem is, the problem is, is that sure we want to accomplish getting that. So we take out one replica and we get the rest. Now in in the frequency domain that's great, but if we try and do this filtering in the time domain, what do we get? X of a of whatever. So um, yeah, yeah. I'm messing up with the, the frequency notation. Ah, unhappy face. But what ends up happening, if we at least try and do this first stage, in the time domain, this is this guy convolved with x of n. Now, this could be whatever. The problem is this guy here, if he's, he's an ideal filter, a low-pass filter, um, in the time domain, he's going to be a sink function. And they go from minus infinity to infinity, like uh, those samples. And so that's a problem, because what's going to happen is, um, if you don't, and we'll see this a little bit later in this class, if you don't go from minus infinity to infinity, your brick wall filter actually looks like this. And you have something here called Gibbs phenomenon. And this is not ideal. We don't want Gibbs phenomenon. Gibbs phenomenon means, essentially, it's like, you know, we want it nice and flat, especially at the edges. And what happens is you have this doesn't look very nice. It's not ideal. It's not a nice, smooth um, uh, response. But let's say, in the, for now, let's assume, let's assume um, it's n everyone's nice and happy. What ends up happening is every sample that we convolve, oh, what we end up getting is something that looks like this. Um, we have, a, we have a, a, a sample, another sample, another sample, another sample, another sample. And so what we're doing essentially is we are uh, putting in a sync function. And so notice that we're using uniform sampling, right? So this is, sam this is spaced out every t, t. Yeah, here it's, let's just say I draw very sloppily. But let's say everything's separated by t seconds. What ends up happening is the sync function will be non-zero at, like, at the, the, those sampling instances at the desired sampling instance. So that's the peak of the sync function. And then it dies away, and its zero crossings correspond to every other sampling instance. That's the beauty of a sync function. This guy here, look at him. Oh, yeah. Peaks. The only place where it's non-zero is the desired sample and is zero elsewhere. Same thing here. Right? And here. And so on and so forth. So that's where we got that really cool diagram. So what you're doing is, under ideal circumstances, you can create all these different sync functions And if you then sum this together, sum all sync functions, what you'll get is essentially something similar to like curve fitting. You'll get like, so let's say you have that. So you'll get something that looks like this. And that's because you're summing all those sync functions together. So try it at home. Like, try it in MATLAB. Like, draw up a bunch of sync functions, position them at different equally spaced, like, you know, uniformly spaced samples, and see what you'll form. You'll have this nice, beautiful curve that'll fit through all the points very nicely. And what happens is, at the precise sampling instances, you'll get the exact values because the sync function will be zero for everything except for desired sampling instance. Everything in between. What I'm doing is I'm filling it up, right? But ideally, that's what should be happening. And, and the problem is your sync function won't be perfect 
because you can't have infinite number of points, right? So you can't go from minus infinity to infinity. All right. OK. So I, your book has this um, kind of like a visual conceptual type of diagram that sort of shows a relationship between when you digitize and when you convert back to the continuous time domain. And as well as between the frequency and the, and the time domain representations of your waveforms in both continuous time and discrete time representations. And so what you've got, this dashed line here represents the upper portion shows the continuous time domain, and the lower portion shows the discrete time domain. The left half shows the uh, time representation, and the right half shows the frequency representation. And so this is kind of like a sort of like a summary chart of understanding how sampling works. So what happens is when you go from one domain to another, so I, under ideal circumstances, so when you digitize, what you're essentially doing is you're basically transforming t, you're sampling every t, big t seconds, boom, 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 boom. And when you reconstruct, what you're doing is you're taking every sample and you're applying a sync function to every sample and summing everything together. And then the conversion between the frequency domain and the time domain are given by these analysis and synthesis uh, equations to represent them in both the discrete time Fourier transform and the continuous time Fourier transform. So again, just a cute visualization of what we've just done. Yes? Uh, what's the frequency response? What's the frequency representation for Gaffer space? Ah, that's a good question. So the question is, what is the frequency response of a delta train? So, so you know, maybe that, that's a good exercise to try out at home. So, so I intuitively... Intuitively, and I, again, I would need to double check. So there's two things I need to double check. Fa phase, whether it uh, is detected by human speech, that's a quick Google search. Um, but I'll look into it. Like, you know, and if Google doesn't have it, then I'm disappointed with Google. No. But the other thing is, um, if you have a, a delta train and you work it out, so like, let's say we take the um, a Fourier transform of a delta. So yeah, so take the Fourier transform of a delta train and see what happens. Uh, my my under my understanding is it will also be a delta train, but but that's just like you know you would have to do the math. I could be wrong, so I'll need to double check that. If it's a delta train, I'm confused because if the same function yep. and the delta train come together, mm. you come up with the exact thing, so they should be the first of the delta train. Yeah, but no, but I mean here. Here's a delta train, but it has different coefficients on it. What I'm sort of thinking about is, um, suppose you take your x n of t, right? So that would be equivalent to, so m where I'm coming from with all of this, is let's say you take that x of t, and then you convolve it with a delta train, or you multiply with a delta train, right? So how would it look like in the frequency domain? And um, you know, this is just gut, right, Intu intuition. I would need to do the math. But so let's say sampling theory, you can use like an, a, a delta train in order to apply it to the waveform in order to get the samples from it. And so, and then the operation in the frequency domain is you have like the original aperiodic spectral representation now is replicated multiple times. What sort of um, mechanism would create those replicas? It would be a delta train convolved with those uh, frequency responses, right? So that's why my, my initial reaction is it would also be a delta train. And that's why I want to double check. But that's why. Like, you, your point is also quite interesting. Like, on the other hand, if we have a delta train and we uh, convolve it with a bunch of, uh, it has, and let's say it has different amplitudes for every uh, delta, and then you convolve it with a sync function, um, what do you get? But I, I, I would double check that math. So I, that's something I'll do after class, OK? But that's a good question. But I think looking from the perspective of sampling theory, going from A to D, and then looking what's happening at the spectra, my gut feeling would, would be is the frequency response would also be a delta train. OK? That's a good question. That's a really good question. All right. So I talked a little bit about aliasing. 
and how it's bad. And this is actually, this, this here, I think I mentioned this example too. Aliasing is super duper tricky when we have cosines and sines because it might not be apparent, but we might be aliasing and we don't really have to overlap with each other, at least not with signal over signal. So what we have here is a case where we have, let's say, this is a proper, properly laid out um, sine and cosine, and then we sample it. And what we notice is that um, we have the left delta of the cosine and the right delta of the cosine, and it repeats, it repeats, it repeats. But look what happens when we have aliasing. The deltas are kind of crossing each other. They're not interfering with each other. They're not overlapping with each other. But, they're, but sort of the, the frequency band that they are playing in, that's buffering them, is overlapping with each other. And therefore, it is aliasing because you're losing track of what is left, what is right, and it complicates the operation later on. You're almost like, you know, so the, the bands in which these guys are operating in are actually overlapping with each other. Okay. Um, and so one thing that we did not talk about is systems do not naturally have um, band-limited spectra. Sometimes what we need to do is something called pre-filtering. So this slide here just kind of illustrates, highlights the importance of something called pre-filtering. What we want to do is if our spectra is not band-limited, we make it band-limited, right? It's almost like when I say that, it almost reminds me of the East German auto manufacturer company before the, uh, uh, the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain fell. Um, they had the motto, if it doesn't fit, we'll make it fit. And then I remember there was a news story about it, and they had a car door that wasn't able to fit, and so they took a hammer to it, and they, <laughs> they definitely made that door fit. But yeah, yeah, don't buy East German cars. So here what we want to do is we're doing, um, we're, what we're trying to do is make sure we avoid aliasing. We band limit the spectra. And so when we do the rest of this A to D, D to A conversion, we don't have any nasty aliasing at the end of the day. And so then we talk about like, you know, with the interpolation and the sing function, and we go into a little bit of mathematics on how this would be performed. Um, and that's where like, you know, with, with this derivation, um, you know, you have this filter that, that you use in order to feed those discrete points into in order to get uh, your reconstructed continuous time waveform. But really what I want to touch on before we call it a day is this idea of doing the analog to digital conversion in real life. What are some of the techniques that are out there? And so there are several. Um, one technique that's often used is something called sample and hold, right? So sample hold is you have your continuous waveform, this guy here, and you basically every t seconds, what's the sample? Okay, and just hold it. So what you get is this kind of stair staircase looking thing. And so every s here means I sample it, and then I hold that value of that sample until the next sampling instant. Then I hold that sample until the next sampling instant, and so on and so forth. So I get this kind of like jagged looking step like function all the way across this waveform. So that's one way. It's a little rudimentary, and another name for it is a, it's a, a zero order hold, or a zero order um, uh, sampling con technique. We can also do, um, essentially, we can, instead of using the sampling hold technique, we can also do something like that linearly connects the dots, too. We can make a line, 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 and then you can do a variety of other techniques as well. But sampling and hold is very simple, quick and dirty. If you want to uh, digitize your signal, this is the easiest thing. Sample, maintain the value. Sample, maintain the value. Sample, maintain the value. And then what you do is you pass this guy through a quantizer. And I talked about quantizers a little bit before. And what they do is they round the value. So that's the difference between discrete time and digital. Discrete time assumes that you have an infinite number of uh, amplitude values, D uh, digital means you have a finite number of amplitude values, each one with a specific binary code or code word that represent it. So what ends up happening is in order to achieve that, we need to quantize. The quantizer essentially rounds some value of the amplitude that's been sampled to the nearest acceptable, allowable 
amplitude value that has a code word associated with it. And so a lot of times, we won't look about at this until a little bit later, a lot of times our quantizer is just a uniform quantizer. We just have a uniform number of amplitude values round to the nearest one, right? And then the number of those, so if we have m quantization levels, then uh, 2 to the b equals m. b is the number of bits that are needed to uniquely represent every quantization level. And we have two types of quantizers. The mid-tread, which means our level is uh, flat uh, at the origin uh, uh, at the x-axis, and mid-rise, which at the origin it rises. And this is the thing I was telling you about about to remember when we design uh, A to D, D to A converse. There's things called step sizes, so, uh, which is the difference between the output value between two adjacent quantizer levels. So essentially, like how far apart are those quantization levels if we're assuming a uniform quantizer? We also have resolution, which is, that's the B. So that tells me how many levels we have. Yes? Yeah. So is, if instead of sampling infinitely fast, if you sample it at half a millisecond sample, yeah. does that matter? Yeah, absolutely, because that, that, that's your f of s, right? Uh, no, but as in, uh, when you capture a sample, you cannot capture instantaneously, because you have to charge capacity, but that is the actual receiver. Well, well that, that, that's what makes A to D converters and D to A converters so lucrative, right? Because what happens is uh, the speed at which you sample, the faster that you can sample, um, you know, there's going to be a noticeable cost increase in your A to D, D to A converter. That, that's why there's, like, you know, you can have something where it samples and it, you know, does an okay job and you get, you know, some decent representation in the digital domain. Or you can have something that's like samples at an incredibly fast rate, but you're paying quite a hefty uh, uh, price for it. It's, you know, basically being able to, to sample something in finite time, but in a very short period of time, is very expensive. That's what differentiates cost between these guys. And then you have the levels, the resolution's another factor, like, you know, being able to assign, um, you know, to, like, let's say you have 16-bit resolution versus 14-bit versus 12-bit, and that tells you how many quantization levels you have. That will also influ influence the cost and the performance of your A to D, D to A converter. And then there are a few of the other things as well, dynamic range, if it's too narrow, you might not be representing the entire waveform. And if it's too wide, well, maybe it's not <coughs> compressed enough, right? And then quantization error is pretty big because when we have a very large range, very few levels, then the difference between what the actual amplitude value is and what its quantization level is might be too, too big. So this all factors into the actual implementation of the A to D converter. So, yeah, we don't, there's no such thing as sampling infinitely fast. That's what F of S is. And F of S, we don't choose what F of S is. F of S is what the physical capabilities of the A to D converter is. So that's a good question, but that, that, that's one of those practical considerations. So when you, let's say if you want to buy an A to D converter, look at one that's slow and look at one that's fast, and you'll see that, well, I'm not sure how you, if you buy them in bulk or anything like that, but that's where the cost factor uh, comes in, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I also have another similar thing to ask you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you described the digital, another problem that I didn't know because, okay, you have two AD converters that tend to overlap, but it depends on the error in the capacitor or something like that, that's 10.1 and that's 10. Well, that, that's where the big bucks come in, right? So in order to eliminate those errors, that's why, you know, there is going to be a physical limit on how fast, like, these guys are going to operate, right? And so what happens is um, it really will translate to what performance you want. Like, you know, let's say those capacitors do introduce some error into the sampling process. Um, like, how much is it, is it acceptable? If you need something that is, like, absolutely perfect or flawless, you, th there are probably people that sell that. But they're probably not going to be cheap. On the other hand, what happens is if you just want something that's good enough and you don't want to sample fast and you have, like, you know, some imperfections, some jitter or whatever, 
that's fine and you know probably it's very cheap you know it really depends on the application how much you're willing to pay right and if someone's out there that sells it right Yep, exactly. Yeah. So and so these are like you know some of the considerations that you need to take uh, take into account. So, okay. So with that, um, I guess that concludes uh, lecture twelve. Uh, okay. So uh, problem set four is posted online. Um,